Okay, so the first question is, um, so you're a soprano and um, you play classical, you're a classical multi-instrumentalist. Um, so tell me about how you became a musician. I've been doing music ever since I can remember as far as, you know, playing instruments and stuff. Um, the, the pop stuff came way later on, sort of after I met Ferris. It was never anything that I expected. I'd never um, even imagined or, you know, that I would be in a band. It just wasn't one of my one of my <laughs> kind of fantasies <laughs> among there. So uh, that was totally ex- unexpected. But playing instruments and stuff I started doing is, you know, from the time I can remember my parents just they wanted to keep me busy and we were in this I grew up in a very small remote town and both my parents were born in in Europe um, my dad was born in Italy and my mom is she's Irish they they wanted to give me like culture they wanted me and my brothers they wanted to provide us with some kind of culture and skills and stuff because we were just so cut off from from everything so they they made sure we <laughs> learned <laughs> piano and, and kept as busy as possible, really. <laughs> Amazing. So how many classical instruments can you play? A lot. It would, <laughs> I'd like if I started, <laughs> if I started listing them. I mean, I went through a stage a while ago where, it, you know, I was collecting instruments and, and learning them, but the, the list is is very, very long. I mean, I I because I play keys, um, you know, like any keyboard instrument, like organ, harp, chord, piano, that, that's like, obviously, those are all kind of easy. And then strings, anything that's a string instrument, I've learned. So anything in the string family, um, I've probably played. Um, um, and then woodwind, you know, I play a lot of woodwinds, like oboe and stuff like that. Um, but I, I'd say out of all the instruments I play, like, some, you know, some I play better than others. <laughs> um, you know, some are, some are, you know, I've been playing my entire life and I can definitely call myself, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a proper pianist, for example, and a, a proper oboist, but some, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm a, I wouldn't compare myself on guitar, for example, with, with someone else who's been playing their whole life. It's just not the same. It's good, um, because... Obviously, you, you said your main instrument is uh, anything keys based, and uh, nowadays you can you can get a synthesizer and you can write different parts and record them through the computer for yeah. a, a whole orchestra, can't you? So yeah, you can. I I don't like doing that. I I I like doing kind of. It's weird. I like writing everything by hand. Yeah. I don't really like using software. It comes out different. Like I can use the software and do it and come, like write something like more quickly and stuff. But it's just. It's just not the same as doing something by hand for me. I actually, I, I enjoy it more, like getting pen out and writing orchestra parts and hearing them in my head yeah. rather than hearing them on a computer. I just, I find it more rewarding. It, the music comes out different. I just, I like doing what people would have done hundreds of years ago, even. It's kind yeah. of crazy to think what they would have done without any like any of this stuff hundreds of years ago and the stuff they were able to write is better than what people are writing today. It's incredible when you think that somebody could sit and write out sheet music and um, know how it would right sound. It, that's like yeah. true genius to me. Yeah, and like when you think Beethoven was deaf and doing it, like that's just crazy. Like, <laughs> I mean, he was writing on orchestra, choir parts, like huge things for, you know, massive amounts of people. And he didn't even have hearing. Uh, so I think I, I like that. But the more stuff we get, like clutches and computers and stuff, the less you're actually hearing. And you think when people can actually hear in your head and use your imagination better too and kind of visualize things differently. It, yeah. You actually have more, I think you have more limitations the more with the more ease that you have. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It just For me, it's just more fun to write with pen and paper. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of art in that and the way it's, uh, you take it back to the way that, you know, it was supposed to be, I suppose, from the beginning. But, um, yeah, like use your brain kind of as <laughs> yeah, well. Like. Use your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is that how you wrote um, for the new album, Treasure House? Yeah, I always write 
scraps down like orchestra parts in you know maybe like a little moleskin book or something <laughs> like that um sometimes um the computer does help because you can layer things like i can record i can record an oboe part and then you know i can record something else on top of that too. you know and sometimes that stuff it does it does help because i don't have all these musicians at my disposal or something so i can record everything on my own and hear how it sounds on the laptop sometimes i would i would do something like that um, it's, uh, you know, it's different every time, like every song is kind of different and depends where I am and, um, what the, what the song is like. It's sort of different approach every time. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you said that you obviously come from a classical background to begin with and, uh, this new collaboration, well, with Faris, it's, uh, since then you've started to learn about, uh, popular music and 1960s girl groups. I mean, I, like, I learned, like, my town was cut off, but there was, like, pop music, and, <laughs> like, there was, I did, like, I wasn't so cut off that I didn't listen to, you know, David Bowie and the Beatles, and, you know, like, I knew the Shangri-Las and the Ronettes and yeah. stuff like that, um, but Ferris, with the girl groups, was on a whole other level, like, he collects obscure, really rare seven-inch vinyls um, and stuff, so, you know, things that... I definitely hadn't heard before, um, and it was just fun. When we first met, we would we would listen to that stuff, and I guess when we started writing together, it was almost like a joke. I would send him, I would write a song kind of making fun of the girl group. It would be like a fake girl group, and I would make kind of a, <laughs> um, my own version of a, a girl group thing. He was like on tour with the horrors, and I would send a girl group song that, that I had recorded, um, and we would kind of communicate back and forth on the email um, with songs that we were doing. It was like a way of communicating, almost like a weird kind of pen friend thing. We would send these songs back and forth. And so I guess when it's there, because he was so obsessed about his girl group collecting, <laughs> that some of the first songs were were like mimicking these girl group songs that he had. I mean, some of them were ridiculous. Like there was one song he played that, you know, a girl gets murdered halfway through the song, like, by oh, the yeah. other girls. And I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know it? Oh, yeah. God, I just, I loved it. I, I, I really liked the drama of it, and so sometimes when we do these songs, we do, like, another, you know, what would have been an undiscovered girl group single. Um, so that, that was how that kind of stuff, that was really how the songwriting started. Between us, it was just something fun we were doing. We weren't doing it seriously. It was kind of like a time-wasting thing, really. But, but that was fun to do. And eventually we had, you know, like an album's worth of songs. And someone at a label heard the demos and, you know, said we should re- record them properly. And it it kind of happened like that, sort of by accident. Like it was fun to record them properly. And then the next thing, you know, we had a manager and then we had a record deal. It was all, it just sort of happened parallel to everything else we were doing in our lives at that time. Cool. Well, I was just thinking that um, obviously because you knew that you were a soprano and uh, like Faris, I don't know if you listened to much of his stuff, but before he met you and started writing with you in this project since 2011, um, I think that it's really affected his vocals in the horrors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Without a doubt. I mean, when we first met, that we were doing a lot of singing and stuff. He, when we first met, he, it was before Primary Colors. Yeah. She was just starting to sing properly <laughs> um, with Primary Colors. Like, when I first turned on, because I didn't know, I didn't know the horrors. And, and um, like, I didn't, I didn't know much about them because I, the stuff that was coming through to me, like, I didn't, wasn't discovering new music in that way. I was the kind of person listening to mainstream radio. And, and then, you know, the obvious kind of iconic music, you know, Pink Floyd or David Bowie or Beatles, the stuff coming through to me was the mainstream stuff. So I didn't, I didn't really come across the horrors. And when I first heard, the first thing I heard, you know, it was like Sheena's a parasite or something. And he was, he was like screaming, you know, (laughs) I didn't know he could, I didn't know he could sing. And that was when we first met, I was uh, like kind of writing songs for him where he would, he would sing, like he was kind of, learning to sing and one one thing about Ferris is he people really underestimate him like he 
it would be easy to listen to Strange House and think the guy can't sing. Um, mm. And not knowing, like, if you listen to him today and you listen to how he's singing now, it's pretty amazing that he basically taught himself to sing properly, <laughs> like, really well. <laughs> like, um, and he does, he underestimates everyone always. He, it's, he, I would never bet money on him not being able to do something. It's kind of dangerous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Even things like soccer, yeah, no one thought he was going to get the goal, and, you know, like, he got the goal. You know, he's just, um, <laughs> when he sets his mind to something, he can he can do it, and people often get the wrong idea about Ferris um, and don't know what he's capable of, so, and I think singing was one of those things. Um, so how did you guys initially meet? It was kind of random. It was one of those things just through someone we knew. It was actually one of my neighbors or something. Um oh. Yeah, it was it was just the usual thing. Someone knows someone, um, and and we met, and we just kind of hit it off right away. We were, you know, really good friends almost immediately. Oh, cool. So, um, I was thinking, like, when I was listening to the new album, um, about your writing process with Faris, and I was wondering if um, you ever write something or he ever writes something and goes, "Oh no, I'm nicking that for the horrors. Like, we can't use that." Or. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, when we did the first album, they had, the horrors had these unused demos left over from, um, between Strange House and Primary Colors, and I took one of those demos and turned it into a girl group song, and so we did, we did do that, we used it for EP, I added, it's called Sunshine Girls, and it, it was, it was a horror song, but I, I added all these girl group, kind of, Shanana, kind of, <laughs> baby baby stuff in it as, as kind of like a joke like it was one of the things I was doing like um to almost annoy Ferris at the time and then but then it it worked so we we did actually release that one so in that case there was a horror song that we did and we still perform today we, we do that one all the time it's one of our favorites to perform because it's got like really high energy um because it's left over from that really great horror stuff um like I love when I listen to the horrors albums, like I really love the first one. I love Strange House. I really like the <laughs> yeah that early that early stuff. Um, I just like the energy in it. It's really hyper. Um, so yeah, and then other way around. No, I don't think they've. It Cat's Eyes is so different from the horrors. Yeah, there's just no way they would. It's yeah. I, I don't think. Um, it, it's like we're writing kind of so from a genuine place with cat size it's really just cat size yeah the horrors would have to like cover it and do something whether it's just would never be written for the horrors but the horrors are like five people and they write together and it's, um so it would be I, I also kind of unnecessary to write something that they would use so they're doing their own thing yeah okay so um so on the 28th of February in 2011, you released uh, the Broken Glass EP on Polydor. And yeah. um, it says on your Facebook now that you're on Rough Trade, but it says also that you're releasing the album on uh, Cobalt. Yeah, we're not on Rough Trade. We're, um, I think it's Cobalt. We yeah. have like our own, we have our own label that I did my solo album on too, called Raff Records. And, oh, cool. and we're putting that out through Cobalt. Cool. I just wondered um, yeah. what was the change of label, but I guess if you've got your own label, then that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works better. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you can pick who you work with and do things your own Do things your own way. You've just got more control. Cool. So um, I know that the first EP, uh, you recorded it at Peter Gabriel's Real World Studios. Yeah, and we did this one at Real World as well. Oh, you did? Okay, great. So yeah. I just wanted to ask what that um, process is like. Um, well, for me personally, like, Real World is all about Steve Osborne, the producer. Like, I, 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 both of us really like working with Steve Osborne. He's, he's the best. And he's, for me, he's, like, part of Cat Size, really. Um, he was, he's done everything. We've done, like, film soundtrack, um, and both albums and the EP. And he's based in Real World. So, um, that, that's why we keep choosing Real World. I mean, Real World is a beautiful, amazing place anyway i mean I, I don't know if you've been there but 
it's it's just an incredible studio on this beautiful piece of land and a really great place to get away and make an album you're cut off from everything else um and it, it's it's just an ideal place to make a record really excellent um well, when i was listening to the album then i was feeling like there was a, a big there was kind of on some tracks a bit of a divide where some are are rooted in classical uh, a classical sound and then others are rooted in like a 60s pop sound like for example girl in the room and uh, be careful where you park your car mostly yeah, like, yeah. like hand claps and things like that it's a different arrangement um, and yeah. and i just wondering if you're influenced by phil Spector's wall of sound i mean definitely um especially in ferris you know with other girl groups and stuff phil Spector is you know, huge for him. And I, I think when we're, when we're making the album, we're not listening for inspiration or references or ideas or stuff. We actually don't listen to anything at all the whole time. But my feeling is if you're listening, if you've listened to something your whole life and it's something you really love, it, it goes into your, kind of almost like your database. You know, like it's, it's there. You've got this source of sounds and whether it's, chords or melodies or a drum sound or something it's comes becomes part of your so like resources yeah. kind of um so whether or not you're listening on purpose or stuff you you when you reach in to look for something a sound that you like or something it's going to be based on things that you loved and heard growing up um so for me it would be you know some of the classical maybe some chord pr- progressions that are just they're they're in there somewhere. Like, if if I love um, the Twin Peaks soundtrack, it it meant it had an effect on me. And so, when I when I write, that's gonna influence it, even if it's you know, fifteen years later um, from when I would have been obsessively listening to it or something. It's I just think that stuff you can't avoid it having yeah. an effect and an impact on your stuff. And I think the Phil Spector, similarly, like. Ferris, you know, listened nonstop to Phil Spector, loves what he did, and it, it's just, at some point in your life, going to have an effect on your taste. Even. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think somebody said that um, you might be in the studio for two weeks actually making an album and, like, writing it just before that, but you're actually putting into it a whole lifetime worth of influences and and everything's leading up to that. Into yeah. Point. Yeah, and especially things that taste. Um, your taste is your taste. It's based on things that you like, yeah. and the things that you like are specific. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think it seeps in, even if like Ferris and I aren't listening to any music at all, and purposely trying not to, um, you know, purposely trying to be completely original and not accidentally copy or anything like that. The things, yeah. you, the things that affected you, they seep in. Um, and even if it's just at the very least a question of taste, like you like what you like, and it affects what, you know, think your choices. So, um, cool. Like, I wanted to know um, the title Treasure House, um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it means different things. So we <laughs> never like spelling it out because it does mean... Um, kind of like even the name of our band has lots of different meanings. Like some people think it means um, the the lights on the road, the reflectors. You know that oh, it's yeah. like a reflective, a reflective thing. And some people think it's a reference to sixties style, like the eye makeup. And some people think it's the um, formation, the the stars. There's like a an mm-hmm. aurora. It's called like a nebula called Ketsa. There's you know, and there's a gemstone. Called, there's it means different things, and same with Treasure House. Um, we kind of like that. It, it some people might think it it means you know almost like a Pandora's box kind of thing, or or it might mean our own little world, or um, you know like a house full of secrets or something. And I I think we both kind of like it, leave being open to interpretation. Yeah. Okay, so does it mean anything in particular to you? (laughs) 
Um, it, it means different things to me too. So I wouldn't like I wouldn't really spell it out. It's kind of vague. It's kind of vague for me. I don't really want to define it. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, I guess it is like it's our own. It's it's our it's our own world, but it does mean it does mean kind of something else. But I wouldn't be able to like just put in a simple like definition. I think. Okay, so does the album as a whole carry a concept? When we're writing, when we're writing these things, like it, we never have like a plan or um, a concept in our head when we're when we're doing it. It just kind of everything falls into place. Like we're writing it, and then suddenly there's there's a thread that's formed on its own. Um, so I think, like if if you're asking if we wrote it with a concept in mind then we didn't it was like some of the songs were written even before the first album um like be careful we punch your car that one we wrote like six years ago and some of the songs were written over the course of five years and wow. like throughout other you know while we were doing other things um and then they just they kind of form a life of their own like it it's kind of its own journey or whatever the album it decides for itself. Like we're we're never consciously or strategically doing things or planning like what this album should mean or what it's yeah. about or anything like that. It sort of does it on its own and falls into place. Okay, cool. Um, I was listening to one of the songs, "Be Careful Where You Park Your Car," and it's like it's like a woman. It's a woman singing, obviously yourself. But it's aimed at a man, sort of warning him of uh, the consequences of, like, how a heartbroken woman from his past relationship could come back at him. Um, yeah. But because it's sung by a woman, it seems a little bit like juxtaposed. So I was just wondering if you wrote it or if Farish wrote it. I wrote that one. Yeah, that was um, that was the one that we wrote like before. Um, the first album, even. Yeah, that was. That was, and it, you know, I guess it's about, yeah, it's about me, really. Oh, okay. Well, it, I just think it's really <laughs> clever the way it comes across, because, uh, obviously, it's, like, quite... Oh, that's good. Yeah, the warning. <laughs> yeah, it's quite unusual to hear a woman's voice saying that sort of thing, because it's, like, that 60s style, but it's a very, like, modern approach. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it was, I, I wrote that song, like, that was another one that was kind of, uh, like a joke, like I was, was kind of like angry about something or whatever, and I sent it to. It was Ferris who wanted to use it on the album. Like I didn't take that song very seriously um, when I wrote the when I wrote the demo. It was, it was just kind of uh, done. I guess it was just done for fun. <clears throat> Some like a, you know, I was telling a story basically. It was you know like telling. I was just telling Ferris this thing, and he but he was the one who thought it should actually be on the album, that it was, like, a proper song, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so, do you have a favourite song on the album? No, it's hard. When you make it, you don't really listen to it. I mean, I guess... Uh, if, if I were to pick a song that I thought people should hear to get an idea of what cat size sounds like or something, I would... I'd probably pick Chameleon Queen. Um, mm. I think that kind of, like, sounds specifically like cat size. I guess the one that maybe meant the most to me when I was writing was probably Everything Moves Towards the Sun, because um, it's kind of like my past, present, and future in a way, and um, I guess that one's probably the most personal. Cool. Um, okay, yeah, cool. I'd say Chameleon Queen. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, I was thinking like one of the standout tracks for me was Names on the Mountain because um, uh. I really like the way it starts with the organ and it develops into a huge wash of harmonies. Um, and I was just wondering like how that came about. Was that a lot of layering? Yeah, that one. I'm glad you picked that one because that one's actually a really personal song too. The Names on the Mountain, the town I, the town I grew up in, um, which is sort of in this, hole in the middle of nowhere like you drive <laughs> for 16 hours from Vancouver like the nearest city is wow. you know, like a 15 hour drive and um you go through like the desert through the mountains and then you 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 kind of eventually through my phone is like someone's trying to call me and it's like, <laughs> um you, you drive like it 
through all this remote wilderness, you get more and more cut off, and you drive into this town, which has the world's largest lead and zinc smelter. So there's the smoke coming up from this hole in the mountains, and you drive down into the mountains, and then there's this town of, like, 5,000 people. And in the middle of this town, there's, like, one school, which is the school I went to, um, and it's next to this really big mountain, and every time someone graduates from the school, they climb up this mountain and they sign their name on the mountain to, like, kind of leave their mark. Yeah, they, like, leave their mark. Like, they don't want anyone to ever forget them and just kind of... A lot of people leave the town and they... Some people never do leave the town and some people, they they can't wait to get the hell out of the town like me. You know, they want to leave, but they don't want to be forgotten. Um, But a lot of people I know, like, that have signed their names, they're not around anymore, like... One guy I knew signed his name on the mountain and then fell to his death, like, on the same day. Mm-hmm. And so it was just, yeah, and it was just that, you know, he was, there's this kind of idea of, like, immortalizing yourself with your name on a mountain. Yeah. But then, you know, he, he died that day. And it, it haunts me, haunts me to this day when I think of him. But, um, uh, you know, people who, they sign their name and they've, you know, they, they've 